Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining me today. My name is Evelyn Culver, and I'm a senior piano performance major here at OU. Um, this lecture recital is in fulfillment of my final honors research project for the Honors College at OU. Um, and it will encompass an introduction to the music of Finnish composer Aino Giovanni Rautavara, specifically his set of six etudes for solo piano, the Opus 42 Etiodit. Rautavara was born in Helsinki, Finland in 1928 and raised in a musical family. His father uh, was an opera singer and cantor. His cousin was a famous soprano and another cousin was a famous cellist. His mother, um, a medical doctor, was the one who arranged for his first piano lessons with his aunt. Um, and initially he was a disinterested and slow progressing student due to the ongoing Second World War. By uh, the age of 17, he lost both of his parents due to the war, so he moved in with his aunt. Uh, he resumed regular piano lessons and theory lessons at this point, and this is where he began a rapid improvement. Um, he entered the University of Helsinki, where he studied piano and musicology, and graduated with a master's in musicology in 1953. Additionally, he attended the Sibelius Academy to study composition. Uh, immediately following his graduation, Rautavara made his first major compositional break with his um, work for brass ensemble, A Requiem for Our Time, which won an American composition competition in Cincinnati. This ultimately allowed him to study at Juilliard for a year and also attend the Tanglewood Festival. In 1957, Rautavara was, uh, went back to Finland and was hired by the Sibelius Academy, um, where he was the professor of composition until 1990. Uh, in 2004, he suffered a serious health condition that kept him, comp for co kept him from composing for a year, um, but he ultimately recovered and composed until his death in 2016. A student of Radovara once described him as having, quote, gone through a huge variety of musical styles and identities and yet never lost his personality. Because Radovara embraced so many compositional styles, often in tandem with one another, categorizing his music can be a challenge. But generally, his compositional output can be divided into four time periods. The first of these is his neoclassical period, which um, primarily is from his student years. Um, then he uh, had a serialism phase for about a decade. Um, then was his neo-romantic phase. And then finally, his mature um, synthetic or second serial phase, which lasted until the end of his life. Um, his earliest compositional influence was Debussy. And the young composer's early works use sonorities that resemble the atmospheric quality of Debussy's music. Radovara's neoclassical phase took off after he began lessons with Finnish composer Are Merikanto. It was Merikanto who introduced Radovara to modernist techniques, which significantly impacted his writing. Another major influence for the composer was um, the Russian neoclassicism of Shostakovich, Prokofiev, and um, Stravinsky. Additionally, Bartok's blend of modernism and folk melodies had a profound impact on Radovara, as the use of folk material was a nationalistic alternative to the precedent of extreme romanticism that Sibelius had set in Finland. While studying in America, Radovara developed a 12-tone technique, which he refined through his studies with Wilhelm Vogel in 1957. This began his decade-long serial period in which he produced a total of 17 compositions, none of which are written for piano. 
Although he enjoyed success as a serial composer, um, he eventually grew tired of the precision and rigor um, involved uh, with the 12 tone technique um, in favor of a more romantic tonal writing style. Following his retreat from serialism, Rodovara's diverse compositional style began to emerge through his use of modernist techniques in tonal settings to achieve a neo-tonal, neo-romantic form of expression. Uh, at this point in his career, elements of free tonality, mirror symmetry, ostinatos, triadic harmonies, religious mysticism, and diatonic sounding polyphonies can be identified across all of Rautavara's compositions. By the early 1980s, Rautavara became focused on large-scale works and began incorporating elements of serialism back into his compositions. Overall, the music of Rautavara's final compositional period primarily utilized pluralism, which encompasses any or all of the compositional tools available to the composer in any combination. Tim Howell, an expert on Finnish music, asserts that Radovar's music does not follow a single line of development, but amounts to a reservoir of compositional resources accumulated over time. Although the piano was not Rautavara's primary instrument of choice when it came to composing, he generally preferred larger textures like um, operas and symphonies. His piano music spans almost the entirety of his career. Some of his, compos uh, some of his earliest compositions are written for solo piano, and the first three pieces in his neo-romantic phase are also written for solo piano. And this could indicate that he might have used the piano to experiment with new ideas before scaling them up to larger textures. His early piano works highlight three notable points of inspiration. These are folk music, religious mysticism, and neoclassicism. His connection with folk music was nationalistic, as I mentioned before. He was deeply moved and intrigued by Christian Orthodox traditions as he experienced a profound connection to Orthodox mysticism during a visit to a monastery in his childhood. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, his use of neoclassical styles was inspired by um, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, and Shostakovich. Two of the composer's most important keyboard works during his neoclassical phase are Pelamanet, which translates to the fiddlers, and um, Iconet, which translates to icons. Radovara did not compose any solo piano works or concertos during his serial phase, um, but near the end of his serial period, uh, his music gained a bit of a romantic edge. The composer's output during this phase places an emphasis on virtuosity, pluralism of styles, and even showcases a few postmodern elements. Overall, Radovara's characteristic components of mysticism folk influence and neoclassicism remain present. Uh, he, Radovara composed five solo piano works and one concerto during his neo-romantic phase. Uh, the most notable of these include the Opus 42 Etudes and his second piano sonata, which is also called Fire Sermon. Um, and both of these pieces highlight some of Radovara's hallmark techniques including orthodox mysticism, references, mirror symmetry, and pluralism of styles. His final compositional phase, synthesis, or his second serial period, is characterized by his heightened interest in Finnish folklore and orthodox mysticism, as well as his determination to form a fully synthetic style. He returned to serial techniques and many of his late compositions employ electronics and extended techniques. Um, he primarily composed large-scale works in this period, and only four solo piano works come out of his final compositional phase. 
Now, before diving into the Opus 42 etudes, I'll just give a brief history of the genre of etudes specifically for the keyboard. The genre of keyboard etudes is a musical style that encompasses a variety of compositional and technical goals. The objective of an etude varies by composer and by time period, but these pieces fall into general categories based on their overall compositional and or technical goals. These categories include didactic, generic, programmatic, variation, and composition etudes. The first etudes emerged in the 19th century, early 19th century, as a result of the piano's rising popularity, and these first etudes were purely didactic. Later in the 19th century, composers like Chopin, Liszt, and Schumann developed the etudes into work suitable for both pedagogical purposes and the concert hall. This is where the categories of generic, programmatic, and variation etudes emerge. Generic etudes refer to those simply entitled etude, um, so the etudes of Chopin and Scriabin. Variation etudes are based on thematic material rather than technical, and programmatic etudes are intended for the concert hall, and they display a variety of styles and forms straying completely from the pedagogical focus. Composition etudes emerged in the early 20th century with Debussy's etudes, which concentrated on sonorities and timbres of the piano rather than specific um, technical challenges. Despite the massive departure from didactic etudes in the 20th century, many composers wrote compositional etudes that also addressed technical elements. Uh, composers Bolcom, Ligeti, and Rautavara all wrote etudes that addressed technical challenges while still retaining um, the compositional devices uh, common to their respective musical languages. Rautavara's etudes each focus on a single interval which guides the compositional process and the assessment of technical issues. Composed in 1969, Rautavara's um, etudes were some of the first pieces written during his neo-romantic compositional period as an effort to return to composing for the piano and um, to return to a more romantic style following his serial period. Um, the etudes were dedicated to Finnish pianist Ralph Gathani and they received mixed reviews for their lack of technical difficulty. Um, the etudes are a series of interval experiments in which the treatment of each interval provides the musical characteristics for each short piece. Overall, these works showcase a dominance of dissonant intervals combined with a romantic writing style. Additionally, these works highlight Rautavara's symmetrical keyboard writing style, as well as other elements from his former compositional periods. The first etude of the set, Tercet or Thirds, is notably the only etude based on a consonant interval. This work utilizes both harmonic and arpeggiated thirds, um, which contrast from the typical melodic thirds we've seen in the etudes of Chopin and Debussy. Um, <clears throat> to achieve the effect of neutral thirds, Rautavara composed the etude via means of bitonality. Despite the presence of polychords, tertian harmonies, um, tertian, the tertian harmony is constructed in such a way that the remnants of traditional harmonic motion can still be heard. This is aided by the heavy emphasis on major seventh chords throughout the piece. Tercet is written in a sonata-like form with a two-part exposition, a brief development, and a truncated recapitulation. The pairing of two triads in bitonal harmony, as well as the intervallic distance between the roots of those two chords and their movements, provide tension and release similar to that of consonance and dissonance. In the first six measures, 
The thirds are presented in stacked ninth and seventh sonorities in both solid chords and in sweeping ascending arpeggios. The opening chord presents two separate harmonies in bitonality whose roots are separated by a third. The following chord is also bitonal, but this effect is obscured because the chords share the same root, E. This creates a kind of doppelganger effect as the movement from the opening polychord to the uh, second E major and minor seventh chord resembles the relationship between consonants and dissonance in traditional harmony. So I'm going to play measures one to two and pay attention to the second chord and how there's a drop in dissonance and how it kind of resembles the a traditional harmonic motion. This doppelganger effect is strengthened in measures five to six, where stacked polychords move inward via keyboard symmetry to arrive on an A minor seventh chord, which again gives us the effect of tonal resolution. So I'll play measures five to six. The texture in the B section changes to two layers, um, a single, stained, si single sustained melody notes and ceaseless waves of arpeggios that swirl above and below the melody line. Bitonal chords continue in the arpeggios which alternate between the hands across the span of the keyboard. The melody has far too many irregular uh, leaps for a traditional melody, suggesting that the musical momentum of this section relies on the vertical relationship between each harmonic block rather than on the horizontal melody. Beginning in measure 30, Radovara adds the occasional eighth note pickup into the melody, which requires a slight change in technique. In order to make these eighth note pickups heard, a slight pause or retard is required in the right hand um, without disrupting the overall flow of the section. So here's what that sounds like at measure 30. The development section, Radovara returns to the texture of the opening chords, this time adding an echo-like answer to the opening motive. In the ensuing rush of bitonal arpeggios, Radovara gradually expands the intervals between the bass and the upper harmonies to build tension that culminates on the downbeat of the recapitulation. The recapitulation repeats the opening nearly verbatim until measure 71, where Rautavara strays from the doppelganger effect in favor of solid bitonality. Um, he ends the etude with the most dissonant polychord, uh, the juxtaposition of a tritone, um, and this eliminates any large-scale tonal reference that could have been made throughout the etude um, as well as ends the work with a sense of instability and suspense. The unstable ending of thirds provides an appropriate transition to the completely atonal atmosphere of the following etude, septimit or sevenths. This perpetuum mobile style etude primar primarily utilizes the major seventh and its inversion, the minor second. Um, in pairs of dyads between the hands. Rautavara also uh, uses harmonic sevenths in the bass to highlight dramatic moments in the etude and add to the overall dissonant atmosphere. Neoclassical elements such as additive phrases and um, additive phrases and frequently changing meters are present throughout this etude. 
Although Septimate lacks traditional formal structure, the piece features two key melodic fragments that are gradually expanded and developed throughout the piece. The first melodic fragment appears in the top voice in measures one to two and is accompanied by the alternating um, major seventh dyads, each separated by a minor second. Rautavarta utilizes the minor second for this opening melody, which is just a D to D sharp. The second melodic fragment is just one note, a sustained A flat in the bass, which first appears in measure five, um, still accompanied by these major seventh dyads. So here's the opening, so you can hear those first two melodic fragments. These two melodic fragments take turns throughout the opening of the etude, and they are slowly expanded to reveal longer melodic lines. A texture shift occurs in measure 31 with the etude's first harmonic seventh. Immediately following is a series of um, dyads that build to another harmonic seventh, this time strengthened by a chordal chord in the right hand. The pairing of this harmonic seventh in the bass with the chordal harmony in the upper voices creates three harmonic sevenths stacked on top of each other. So the downbeat of measure 33, we have this seventh in the bass, and then we have this on top, and then we have the third seventh in between the hands. So here's measures 30 to 33. Um, Radhavara then abandons the dyad pattern um, after this part for just two measures, um, and then immediately following that is a brief recurrence of the second melodic fragment before the volume drops to pianissimo, and he begins a long crescendo to the coda section of the etude. Like earlier in the piece, um, he brings back the harmonic sevenths this time in the lowest register of the keyboard. Um, the harmony in this section rests on B flat and A flat and is unchanging until the final measure of the piece, which ends on the lowest note of the piano. Additionally, Radovara gradually shortens the length of these harmonies as he fragments the dyad motives all the way to the final measure. And now for a couple of technical notes about this etude. Um, in my opinion, this is the most technically challenging etude of the set. Um, significant redistributions are required throughout the first page in order to play the piece at tempo. These re redistributions were a little bit mind boggling at first as the hands primarily have to alternate thumbs. Um, so for example, in measure one, um, on these inner voices, the hands are alternating thumbs, and I'll do my best to dictate which, which thumbs are playing at what time. So it starts with the right hand, left, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, and then faster. So that, that took some coordination. Um, uh, another technical challenge is uh, there's some strict places where hand coordination is in, choreography is involved. Um, so in measure 14, the left hand must first play over the top of the right hand, and then it has an eighth note to quickly get underneath. Um, so this is what that looks like slowly. And at a faster tempo. Um, and then finally, the, the work's highly atonal sound, as well as its lack of formal structure, 
uh, lends to this piece's difficulty. Uh, the third etude, tritonuxit, or tritones, is the shortest etude of the opus in terms of measure numbers. Uh, Radovara's teacher at Juilliard, um, Parachetti, claimed that the tritone is difficult to classify as either consonant or dissonant, as it has both neutral and restless qualities depending on its context. Radovara takes full advantage of the ambiguity of this interval in the work, and he presents both of the tritone's possibilities in just the first three measures. The first three tritones occur between the soprano and alt the first three tritones between the soprano and alto voice occur in measures one and two. All of these tritones move immediately to a more stable and consonant interval in the following beat, thus highlighting the restless quality of the tritones. So this is measures one to two, and listen how after each tritone it's resolving to something more consonant. In measure three, the context changes as Raudavara writes unresolved tritones on every beat, thus highlighting their neutral quality. So here's measure three with unresolving tritones. The horizontal movement of all four voices follows the octatonic scale with two voices moving upwards and two voices moving downwards. The choice of the octatonic scale with this kind of symmetrical writing suits the study of tritones quite well since the entire scale is made up of four tritones. The octatonic scale uh, continues in all voices as they play in parallel open ninths in contrary motion, um, building tension to the downbeat of measure five where the opening theme returns in the top voice only. Um, it has added accompanying voices that move in parallel motion with the top voice in tritones. The descending middle voice is strengthened with descending parallel tritones. I should note that there are no longer any resolutions to these tritones, um, thus making the music more static at this point. The bass octaves in bars five to seven, as well as in the opening two bars, spell out a B diminished seventh chord, which adds yet another layer of tritones to the texture. The restless quality of tritones with the resolutions returns in measure eight in a higher register, um, with the lower voices now having overlapping tritones that resolve to overlapping sixths. The final iteration of the melody comes in measure 10, in which Radovara uses inversion and symmetry around B and F, which is a tritone, while the melody and alto voice expand from a major second to a minor seventh, the tenor and bass voices do exactly the opposite. They um, contract from a major seventh to, I mean a minor seventh to a major second. Um, so this is measure 10 to hear that inverted writing. And it resolves on a tritone. The etude ends with a series of increasingly dramatic polychords that span the range of the keyboard, culminating in a triple stacked tritone. This is followed by an ambiguous and foreboding um, alternating tritone motive, which ends the work. Now, although this etude is not technically demanding, 
It does require large hands for many of these big cords, um, which really should not be broken or rolled given the nature of the harmonic tritones in this etude. The fourth etude in the Opus 42, Cavartit, or fourths, is arguably the most tonal and the most romantic work of the set. Um, it bears some similarities to the third's etudes, uh, to the third's etude, um, such as its uh, texture with the long sustained melody notes accompanied by this rapid ostinato pattern. Another similarity is the presence of doppelganger chords or um, where Radovara is mimicking tonal harmony. Um, and in this etude, it's, uh, these doppelganger chords are presented in chordal harmonies versus tercet, which they were in tertian harmonies. Additionally, uh, Kvartit features mirror symmetry and melodic development throughout the entirety of the work. The piece opens with the familiar sustained melody accompanied by a rapid ostinato pattern that swirls above and below the melody like we've seen in thirds. The ostinato is quartal in its harmony and it's symmetrical around D. It's made up of the notes D, G, and A, both of which, so G and A, are both a fourth away from D, making it symmetrical. Um, the single melody line soon changes to chordal chords in the right hand, while the left hand continues the ostinato. The movement between these chordal chords paired with the static accompaniment and the constant presence of sevenths gives us this doppelganger effect or um, the effect of tonal resolution. The most obvious example of this occurs in measures 24 to 25, where the movement of the bass line, a half step down, and the downward contour of the melody create the illusion of a harmonic resolution on the downbeat of measure 25. And this is strengthened by both of the outer voices landing on D um, on the downbeat of 25. So that's what this sounds like. See if you can hear how he's mimicking this harmonic resolution. I'll play it again. A texture change occurs soon after this point um, as Radovara gives the melody to the left hand, interestingly in perfect fifths rather than perfect fourths, um, while the right hand takes over the ostinato. Radovara also gives the left hand a waltz-like accompaniment pattern. Rather than keeping the accompaniment in perfect fourths, he includes um, both the augmented and the perfect fourth simultaneously between the right hand ostinato and the left hand waltz pattern. The waltz-like chords eventually take over in a shrill, dissonant, bell-like passage that descends symmetrically around D until finally resolving in measure 48. The downbeat of measure 48 is another doppelganger chord giving the illusion of tonal resolution through the three unison Ds and the omission of the augmented fourths, resulting in an abrupt absence of dissonance. So here's what that sounds like. The final section of Kvartit begins one measure later with a piumoso indication. The melody in this section is a development of the previous melody that was in chordal chords in the right hand, and it also bears resemblances to the left hand open fifths melody. Radovara brings back the augmented fourths to the ostinato pattern which is now in sextuplets rather than 16th notes. The coda begins with a long crescendo and stringendo buildup constructed on the pentatonic scale. And this culminates on one last iteration of the main opening melody. 
This is the climax of the etude as the hands are at the extreme ends of the keyboard. Radovara brings back the additional, Radovara brings back the original ostinato accompaniment while the melody is written in four note diatonic major chords. This moment is the closest to traditional harmony Radovara gets at any point in these etudes as he's given us, as he gives us diatonic harmonies rather than these doppelganger or, or illusory chords that he's been using uh, thus far. This is also the first etude he's chosen not to obscure the tonal references that close the piece, like in thirds and in tritones, um, as he ends on a perfect fourth. Similar to tritones, seconded or seconds is a slower moving and quieter contrast to the other bravura etudes in the set. The texture of this etude has steady major seconds um, in ostinato throughout the entire etude with only a brief interruption in the middle. The melodies appear in short motivic statements which are slowly expanded through additive process. Additionally, mirror symmetry plays a pivotal role in this etude. Second, it consists of three main voices, two outer voices presented in two note chords that are written in keyboard symmetry, and the steady ostinato dyads in the middle. Uh, Radovara's use of D and E flat for the ostinato reveals his intention to create symmetry around D. D is also the symmetrical axis for the motivic statements that occur above and below the ostinato. The lower voice begins the additive motive, which increases in length with each statement. And each motivic and melodic line moves in stepwise motion following the focus on seconds. So here's the opening so you can hear the additive motive. The first full phrase of the work begins in measure seven and spans three bars using materials taken from these previous expanding motives. The entire phrase, measure seven to nine, is a mirror image of itself and it maintains keyboard symmetry in all the outer voices. Um, following a brief transition in measures 10 and 11, the first nine bars of the piece are repeated nearly verbatim with the roles of the outer voices reversed. This short transition reveals the first large intervallic leaps in the piece. The melody is brought to the upper register through, a ser through sparkling arpeggio of ninths, which are displaced seconds. This flourish is similarly mirrored in the bass in the opening, um, after the opening nine bars are repeated in the upper voice. So here is this flourish in both the upper register and the lower register, so you can hear the mirror symmetry. And then in the left hand. The ostinato comes to a halt in measure 22, and each piece of the three-layered texture is reduced to a single line, which moves contrapuntally. At this point, Radovara also abandons the previous quality of seconds in favor of an octatonic sonority created from the three lines. The use of the octatonic scale builds tension in this section 
which is aided by the addition of a fourth voice in measure 24. In the following bar, the texture changes again to a homophonic series of rising triads that spell out three layers of octatonic scales. In the following bar, um, the left hand enters uh, imitating the right hand line and thus adding another three layers of octatonic scales to the texture, giving us six octatonic scales in total happening at once. The climax of the etude comes in bar 28, where Radhavara has both hands flying to the extremities of the keyboard in octaves and chords, all of which are in precise keyboard symmetry. The ostinato returns in octaves, which quickly reduce to the original dyads on D and E flat. The left hand restates the opening motive for the final time in the lowest register of the keyboard, which is answered with echoes in the upper register. The etude finishes in symmetry with an abbreviation of the previous arpeggiation figures, this time in both hands, and the repeated ostinato um, shared between the thumbs of each hand is what closes this etude. The final etude of the set, Quintet or Fifths, is the shortest but most bombastic work in the opus. It's written in a toccata-like style and contains neoclassical as well as folk elements. The harmonies uh, include primarily open fifths with the addition of a minor second. This 8-8 eight, eight time signature is really a two, a, sorry, a three plus two plus three meter, which is a popular Bulgarian folk rhythm. This folk inspiration is strengthened by the use of open fifths, which create a rustic sound. The form of this etude is roughly ABA with a varied um, and shortened returning A section. The piece opens with a highly rhythmic repeating pattern that emphasizes the third pulse of each measure. This effect is strengthened by lifting the pedal abruptly on the third pulse of each measure, creating stark textural contrasts within every bar. Um, so that is what this here's what that sounds like um, in the first few bars. The B section begins in measure 29, and Radhavara introduces a small melodic fragment um, accompanied by the same right hand material that we've had. Uh, interestingly, he chooses to present this melodic material in major 6 4 chords rather than using fifths. This provides a harmonic contrast that produces an even greater variety of sound in the work, as the B section is also written in a higher register. Soon, the melody begins to contract inward on itself from a major sixth, as Rautavara indicates, to crescendo to the return of the A section. Some of the A material is briefly restated before Rautavara begins the final buildup to the end of the piece. In this final crescendo, the fifths in both hands move outward from each other while continuing the toccata pattern. And this culminates on the final chord of the work, which is really a cluster. This cluster, like we've seen before, blurs all tonal references that could have been previously heard. Um, although this accent and cluster makes for a definitive, incisive ending, um, which contrasts from the endings of thirds and tritones, which were more obscure and unstable. So here is the final line of fifths. And listen for how he obscures the tonal references with the final cluster. Now that I've given a brief introduction to the composer and each of his six etudes, 
I will finish with a performance with the Opus 42 Etudes. Rautavara's wife described the Etudes in this way in Rautavara's autobiography. She said, each interval seems to have an inner nature of its own, to strive and possess a certain value, to create a certain atmosphere. During this performance, listen for the unique ways in which Rautavara treats each interval, and uh, listen for the variety of textures and colors he can create with the intervals. Listen for elements of neoclassicism, mysticism, and folk rhythms. Um, and additionally, listen for areas where Rautavara is mimicking tonal harmony with doppelganger chords. And see if you can identify any moments of symmetry throughout the performance. Um, after the performance, I'll have a brief period to take questions. And um, I hope you enjoy and thank you again for coming.
And now I'll open it up to questions, if anyone has any. Yes? I really enjoyed your explanation of the doppelganger effect that you described, the kind of referencing tonality without really using it. And mm -hmm. I was just curious if that was something the composer used to describe that effect, or if it was like musicologists, or if you coined the term yourself. I did not coin the term. Okay. Um, but I, I noticed it, you know, initially when I was learning the pieces, and then um, when I was doing my research, I found that term. And I thought it applied, yeah. Yes? Yeah, really wonderful. It was really great to hear you. Um, what was the most difficult aspect of learning the whole set? Was it some technical aspects and text in one of the movements? Or was it the writing itself that was pretty thick? You know, I, I found these etudes to be very manageable, very approachable, aside from the second, the seventh etude, just because um, it just took me so long just sitting there to figure out, to construct a redistribution. Um, because it's pretty much impossible to play, just looking at it, how it's written on the page. Um, and so it took a lot of, like, careful hand choreography, kind of, is what I would say um, with that one. And then additionally, that one was probably the hardest to analyze, too, because it didn't really have a form. Um, there was nothing tonal, really, to hold on to. Um, it was just, it's just those additive motives um, that, that drive the piece, essentially. Actually, the seventh, because because when it's it's fun when you when it's going fast and you're just kind of hitting a note there and there and you know, um, but other than that, I think fourths is probably my favorite to listen to, um, and uh, the fifths is really fun as well. No one else? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for being here for my lecture recital. This was fun, so thank you. Have a good day.